As a coach, I work on many different things with my players, things like technical skills and tactics, as well as conditioning, which is even further subdivided into speed, strength, mobility, coordination and endurance. Now, if I'm coaching under eight teams for 60 minutes twice a week and have to take all these things into consideration, I have to make a decision beforehand on what's important to me, what I should focus on and what I could neglect. By the way, this is also valid for any other age group as well. So to all the under eight coaches, it's okay for you to neglect the isolated endurance training. However, it's a completely different story in competitive sports, where you focus on isolated endurance training much more intensively because of the higher number of training sessions, the higher level of game experience of the players, as well as their technical skills and their technical awareness. In this case, focusing on isolated endurance training actually means jogging through the woods without a ball, which is not a lot of fun, as we all know from our past. We as coaches want the young boys and girls to come home to their parents and tell them, I want to go there again next week. My son unfortunately stopped playing for a couple of years after he came home from training one day and told me he wasn't having any fun. That's why we're all required to make training fun for the kids and to know what's important for the development and the progression of kids on all respective youth levels, while also being aware of what keeps them coming back to the clubs and to sports in general. On the competitive level, we have an endurance training session once a week. The training sessions consist of specific drills in several variations, and we always select four of these drills for each one of the sessions. Two of the drills are focused on playing, while the other two are focused on running. That way, players are always switching from playing to running, from playing to back to running, twice completing the four stations in the course, and thus eight four-minute intervals altogether. You might ask yourself now, when and how often are we going to do endurance training? Back in the old days, endurance was only trained during the pre-season, when players were simply jogging through the woods for the first three weeks. And of course they were completely frustrated, because they weren't even seeing a ball during that time. And after those three weeks, they were done with endurance training for the rest of the season. Well, that's not the case anymore. Endurance has to be trained continuously, and the players have to be constantly stimulated as well. That's why we have an endurance training session once a week. An endurance workout should take up about 45 minutes of a 75-minute training session. So when you train twice a week, for example Tuesdays and Thursdays, you could have a 45-minute endurance workout after working on some technical and coordinative aspects of the game for the first 30 minutes, thus completing Tuesday's 90-minute training session. To really understand the impact of endurance training, here's some background info. The human body contains adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. It's not really important to remember the name, but it's important to remember, though, that the body needs fuel to perform certain actions. Fortunately, the human body is able to refuel at different service stations. One of these service stations is labeled air. I always compare it to an old diesel filling station. The old diesel fuel was cheap and got us far, but we couldn't go very fast with it. So the service station which activates our fat metabolism actually is available everywhere. Next we come to a service station where we can fill up super, unleaded. We all know super is a bit more expensive, but it's not available everywhere, but we can go a little faster with it. The super represents our carbohydrates. Then there's also a station to fill up kerosene. That's a really fast fuel, which represents our sprinting abilities. Those are all the phosphates. Scientists have argued about this last reservoir because it does make us go very fast but they're not sure for how long this reservoir actually is available, or for how long you're able to run using it. 
It's been proven that it's only available for a matter of seconds because even runners, guys like Usain Bolt, actually slow down during a 100 meter dash. So this reservoir empties up even during this very short time span. Therefore, it's safe to say it's only about seconds with this reservoir. But scientists also argue whether the middle reservoir, the middle station, our carbohydrates, is available for only about 45 minutes or even a few hours. And there's also our diesel filling station, which is the air that we breathe. With the unlimited supply of air and the utilization of our fat reserves, which we also have enough of in our body, our energy or our fuel, the ATP is produced. The results of most diagnostic endurance tests, combined with the requirements of playing football, have shown that actually we mostly generate our energy from the middle reservoir during games. But also during training, we're mostly getting our energy from within this reservoir as well, because most of the times we train with the same intensity as we're playing in actual games, of course. But in order to improve our endurance, it's necessary to use all three stations and their pumps at some point, and therefore we all have to train with the necessary intensity in order to improve our endurance. The young players on our team can almost completely neglect using the aerobic pump or the fat metabolism pump located at the first station because players usually recover relatively quickly at a young age and the regenerative measures are quite good on the youth levels as well. So if you're a coach on the youth levels and you train kids twice a week, it really isn't necessary to schedule any regeneration runs. Consequently, we're training to use a middle reservoir during the game and very often through drills like four on four up to six on six during training. But we also need to train with a higher intensity so that we can use the other stations as well. For that, we use the high intensive interval training, also known as HIT. During HIT, our players train very intensively in four-minute intervals, each one followed by two-minute recovery periods, completing eight four-minute intervals altogether during the training session. Let's stay with the image of the three different fuel pumps for a little longer. I've mentioned before that the diesel pump is a slow one, then it gets a little faster and then really fast after that. The individual aerobic threshold is the area where we switch from the aerobic state, the state in which we produce the fuel with the aerobic respiration, to the aerobic state where we have to resort to the carbohydrates or the phosphates in our body to generate energy. This area is located between the first and the other two service stations. And of course, we don't have unlimited amounts of those carbohydrates or phosphates in our body to produce the fuel, the ATP. It would be great for players to be able to run as fast as possible, while also pushing the individual aerobic threshold as far up as possible at the same time, so that they're able to generate as much energy as possible with the air that they breathe. Since every player has a different threshold, we as coaches are called upon to train players in different ability groups by using certain diagnostic options. I will expand on these options later in detail. Some players might reach a high level of exertion during the regeneration phase while running at a speed of 10 kilometers per hour, thus using the diesel station, whereas other players might reach this level while using the middle station. There even might be a player who is at a sprinting pace at 10 kilometers per hour. By the way, a lot of Germans would be at a sprinting pace at 10 kilometers per hour. That's why a coach has to divide his team into different ability groups by converting the values he has received from performance diagnostics into the distances the different groups now have to run on the pitch. The slowest group of players either run short distances or at a slower pace to get from point A to point B rather than the middle group or the group of the fastest players. These groups have to run more to reach higher levels of intensity and exertion.